right. It's going, everybody. Welcome. Doing it. The Storytelling Saturday. As it is every Saturday in the uh, era of the quarantine. Uh, if you're tuning in, if you're one of the, if you're one of the early birds, uh, you know, it takes a little bit for people to catch wind and, uh, jump into these things. So if you're tuning in, you're one of the early birds, hit that like button, hit that share button, uh, get the, get the word out. We're going to be kicking off, uh, into the check-in and story, just a moment, uh, just a moment here getting out of the parking lot it's kind of a, a weird bumpy little parking lot so I always have to make sure that I don't hit all the crazy potholes that might be around uh, and not make this too bouncy um, so uh, today I'm going to tell you guys the story of uh, my first time my first real performance in stand-up and kind of go into into just a little bit of uh, you know the the history of uh, well, well the my performance history essentially. Uh, I will also drop in a little little check in to see how everyone's doing. I'll, I'll give you guys my my little check in from from yesterday as I as I do in these videos. Let you guys know what's going on uh, up in the old noodle, up in the old the old Krish noodle, the old brain. Uh, Now we're on it. Now we're on the road. Uh, Pennsylvania has put out an order for, for anybody in Pennsylvania watching. I don't know if this is the same all across the country or not. Um, but if it is, uh, feel free to leave a, a comment about it to let uh, to let people know. I don't know how, how much common knowledge uh, this is at this point. But um, Pennsylvania particularly, starting tomorrow, uh, Sunday... Um, and I have to do a, a little bit more research about this. Uh, but uh, the word is uh, that starting tomorrow, April 19th, um, we will uh, have to wear masks in order to go into any sort of an establishment. So if you're outside, that's fine. Um, you know, you, you don't have to overly concern yourself if you don't feel it necessary. It is highly encouraged that you do wear a mask. Um, but starting tomorrow, if you want to get into a building such as a grocery store uh, or a bank or what have you, you should wear a mask. That's what they're being, what, what you're being told. So. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways. Lots of people are making masks, which is very cool. Um, I had a friend send me some, which is very nice. Uh, my friend Kat from Baton Rouge sent me some. Super, super fucking cool. Super fucking nice of her to do that. She did not have to do that. Uh, but it's very cool that she did. But, uh, you know, before that, uh, I, I was, uh, I used my scarf uh, I have a, I have a old plaid scarf, uh, and it makes me, uh, look like a superhero, so, uh, I wore that for a bit, um, so if you don't have, uh, an official, uh, mask, which I'm not even fucking comfortable wearing the masks, to be honest, um, you know, so, I, if you're like a, a, a medical professional or, or someone in the, in the essential workers field and, and you're like, hey, I don't particularly have like a, a medical grade mask or something along those lines, uh, hit your boy up, um, and, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll gladly help out, um, you know, uh, give, give what I have to someone that might not have, uh, uh that, so, uh, wanted to kind of throw that out there, but, uh, that's gonna happen tomorrow, uh, and then, um, you know, just stay safe, uh, make sure that you're taking care of each other. I just saw, my, my parents' building has a lot of, um, uh, older folks that, that, uh, that live in there, so I'm always a little careful kind of wandering around the building, um, 
It's like older folks. Uh, there, there's a quite a bit of Indian families that live there as well. Uh, so it's this interesting, weird kind of cross section of, of uh, human beings that uh, live in this building. And I just saw an older woman, grandma, uh, that I was getting a, a little visit from from her grandkids. And uh, she just stand outside the car wearing a mask and stuff. And I guess it was the grandkids' birthday. And it was kind of, it's kind of heartbreaking, you guys. Right before I got into the car, his grandma was like, "Oh, I'm so sorry. We're not going to be able to spend for, uh, your birthday together. I miss you very much." And I guess the kid was kind of getting uh, upset about that too. And um, you know, she's got her mask on and wearing these gloves and standing out in the cold just to fucking see her grandkid. You know, and it's. Uh, I don't know, fucking heartbreaking. Um, we're like, man, when are we gonna, you know, hopefully see the other side of this thing? Um, and what are we gonna do when we get to, get to, get to the other side of this thing? I, I hope that we are going to move forward in creating a better society that is more uh, compassionate and driven on collaboration rather than competition um, and uh, unfettered profit. That is, that is the hope that I have, uh, you know, is uh, I hope that we, we don't look at things in terms of, of profit motives all the time and understand that sometimes we have to do, uh, w do stuff that's just, it's just for the betterment of humanity, you know, that's just betterment for each other, uh, to take care of each other and, um, yeah, go forward, go forward that way. So, uh just that was kind of a heartbreaking thing other than that I'm, I'm i'm doing pretty good i um i figured out the format for the zoom show that i want to do and how i kind of want to run that i'm i'm still trying to figure out how to make this thing work because i think i'm gonna have to um pay for the zoom which uh if i can if i can get this test show which i've scheduled for April 25th, which is next Saturday at 8.30, and it's free, but I'm limiting it to 10 people. Um, if I can, if I can make that happen, um, you know, it'll, it'll kind of just pay for itself with, with a couple of shows that I'll do, and I'm trying to figure out a day of the week that I will would like to do them as well because as of right now uh I think Ron Placone and Graham Elwood do st do it on on Saturdays and I don't want to step on their toes or or really be in competition with them because uh for a couple of reasons one um they're my friends well I've known Ron for you know a decade and I don't want to uh step on what they're doing and for two they have a much larger following than me and that would just be like dumb to just kind of try to split that audience um and make people pick between you know me and ron i would i would rather people um you know the 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 fans that we do have that kind of mesh that venn diagram between myself and uh ron and grandma wood and stuff i would i would much rather them be able to enjoy uh both of the shows rather than having to pick one so I'm thinking maybe uh, Fridays, maybe Thursdays, since I've kind of relegated that day to be off. But I don't know if I particularly want to do a show on Thursdays. Uh, I might want to relegate Thursdays to just be the day that I uh, enjoy to um, write and uh, perhaps just take a slow day to just be a slow day in the week. Um, maybe Sundays are, are a better day. Uh, or Fridays, I'm not sure, um, yeah, I have to kind of figure that out, so, uh, during that test show that I'll do next Saturday, um, I might ask the 10 people that show up at that test show of what they think of what a day to start would be, um, so that's, that's there, that I'll, I'll put up a Facebook event, uh, you know, tomorrow morning, on Sunday morning and get the word out for that uh, and uh, hopefully we'll get we'll get 10 people within the week to to jump on board and uh, I'll have a, I'll have a better understanding of how to use zoom for the for the things that I would like to use zoom for um, and go
go from there. But, uh, okay. Uh, that's the little quick update from yesterday. Uh, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling real good, you guys. This has been really, this has been a much better week than uh, last week was. Last week was quite challenging. And, you know, I felt, uh, I felt like I wasn't um, as motivated as I, uh, as I normally would be. So I kind of, I, I was able to get out of that funk, um, you know, so. Uh, anyway, so, um, earlier this week on Wednesday was my 15th comedy anniversary. I'm, I'm, I, I posted that it was my 17th comedy anniversary, uh, and that's because I'm dumb and don't know how to do math, apparently. Uh, during, during the quarantine, my math skills have, um, just uh, disappeared, uh, so, <laughs> this was 15, um, it's the 15th year, and, uh, I apologize if I misled anybody, uh, to, to think that it was anything that it was not. What a fool, what a fool I've been, uh, no, I'm kidding, uh, but it was the 15th year, uh, anniversary on Wednesday, so I released a, you know, a, a, a new clip of stand-up, um, uh, from my upcoming album, a much shorter version of the bit than what is going to be on the album. Uh, the, the bit on the album is uh, far more expansive and uh, written out a little bit more. But, um, yeah, and, uh, you know, uh, I wanted to tell you guys the story of my very first uh, stand-up comedy show. The very first time I got to, like, perform a, a live stand-up comedy show. Now, some people, and this is a, 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 this is like a big exclusive reveal right now, too, is because uh, some people might know that the first time I ever did stand-up was in high school. And if we get real technical about it, that's uh, not entirely true, actually. It is not entirely true. The first time I did stand-up was actually when I was like 12. Um... Uh, and uh, I don't really count this as, as like the official start to my like stand-up career or anything like that because, um, you know, I, uh, I did it that, this one time when I was 12 and then I, and then I kind of never thought about it till I was, you know, 16. And basically what happened when I was 12 is the Andy Warhol Museum um, would, uh, I, we would go to the Andy Warhol Museum as part of National Junior Arts Honor Society. Um, and I was maybe, like, in the seventh grade at this point. Um, and uh, in the basement uh, during one of these National Junior Arts Honor Society uh, meetings or field trips or whatever you want to call it, they were doing um, a, a uh, talent show. And they started the talent show. So we got there... Uh, I got to skip, like, the last two or three periods of school, which was amazing. Uh, honestly, that was part of the reason why <laughs> I joined the National Junior Arts Honor Society is because sometimes you get to just get the fuck out of school. And that was, like, a real cool fucking thing uh, for, for a 12, you know, 12, 13-year-old kid to do. Uh, and I got to hang out with all my friends. So my buddy Mark... Uh, so you know, we were kind of in a trio. It was, it was me, my friend Mark, and my friend Evan, and we were kind of like uh, the three musketeers, kind of, uh, you know, we were, we were kind of inseparable, uh, and uh, so, the, you know, that's kind of what happened. We showed up, we would, we walked around, we checked out all the art stuff. Uh, there was like a weird exhibit of uh, Andy Warhol uh, where he ate an apple, uh, but he would only like, take like one bite of this apple, and then he would, uh, like, say things into a camera, and then he would leave, and then he would come back and take another bite of it. It was fucking weird, you guys. Uh, but in the basement, they were doing this talent show, and so we were like, all right, we'll go check out this talent show, because our bus wasn't going to get there till like, 8.30, 9 o'clock, and it was starting at, like, 6 or something. So we, you know, went down, um, and, uh, we, you know, we, we were just fucking hanging out down there, and, uh, and my buddy Mark comes up, and he goes, hey, um, I signed you up for the talent show. And I was like, the fuck are you talking about, dude? And he goes, yeah, I, I signed you up 
uh, for the talent show. And, uh, and you know, you can do, like, stand-up because you tell all these jokes uh, at, at lunch. And I thought that'd be cool. And I, like, kind of had a panic attack because I was super not prepared for this at all. Um, and he was like, yeah, you're, you know, I sent your name like five or six. So you have some time to kind of figure out what you want to do. Um, and so like I scrambled my head and so they, you know, um, started the talent show and, uh, I got called up and I went up and I did five minutes. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I, do, I, I remember some of the jokes because some of the jokes did end up being the jokes I ended up t uh, telling uh, during, like, the first official time that I did stand-up, right? Um, where I went up, and I told a joke about growing up, uh, in an Indian household, uh, you know, with, with, uh, strict immigrant parents. Um, I did a joke about, uh, what else did I do a joke? Oh, I did a joke about the dot, because I'm 12. That was like a thing that people asked me about all the time. Um, and then I, I did like two or three other jokes. These are all like short, quick. They're not really flushed out. They're just like I like I just kind of threw them out. Um, and then I think I did it. I think my closer was about one Jeff Corwin. Yes. Okay. It was about Jeff Corwin. And, uh, what would happen if Jeff Corwin, instead of, like, uh, what if he lost his job as a, as a nature documentarian, um, and then couldn't cope with it, and would just follow, like, regular people around? Yeah, I think that was my closer. Oh, I think, I think I also did another joke about, uh, being a very hyperactive kid, having too much sugar, uh, in gym class, maybe? That was a joke that I, uh, that I did at that time, uh, but where I thought it was hilarious. Um, and then there was a local access, public access person there, uh, and then they, like, interviewed me about my comedy influences, and I was like, this is the first time I've ever done comedy. I don't know, my sister likes it when I tell jokes. <laughs> I'm 12! <laughs> I don't have life experiences. <laughs> Did you hear what I talked about? I talked about uh, Jeff Corbin stalking regular people. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I, I, after that, we 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 hung out at the at the thing for a bit, and then we fucked off, right? Like, cause we're fucking twelve. We don't have. Uh, the attention span to like sit through, uh, you know, a talent show with poetry and music and uh, magic or whatever it was. We were 12. We had other shit to do and then we got on the bus and we left and, th and, th and you know, I never, I never really thought much about it. And really the only people that from my high school that saw me do that was Mark and Evan. And I think my buddy Ozzy was there too. Um, Ozzy, we called him Ozzy. Well, he wanted to be called Ozzy. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, but, uh, you know, like there was like two or three people. There, not, nobody from high school really knew I did that. And I never really fucking told anybody about it. I don't think, I think there's, there's like three people that I've told this story to. Um, and they might have all been, like, people that I've been in relationships with. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so that's, like, that was, like, the first official... So then four years later, um, you know, uh, my high school did a talent show for the, for the high school magazine. It was called Exhalations. And they were doing a talent show, uh, and uh, I think it was, like, a talent competition as well. Uh, yeah, it was a talent competition as well. So, uh, it was run by uh, one Mr. Alan Welding, who has come to see me perform uh, a couple different times, which is very cool. He was actually at my last album recording, uh, which was super fucking cool. Uh, but he was, uh, he was part of, he, I think he was one of the teachers that was uh, uh, one of like the, the teacher mentors. Is that a thing? 
Is that that's what it's called? I, I can't remember. Anyway, uh, but you know, like he was part of the the, the magazine, helped put the magazine together. Uh, teacher mentors. I, I can't remember exactly what they're called. <laughs> uh, I'm sure some somebody remembers what what they're called. But uh, you know, so uh, they were gonna do auditions for uh, for these talent for these talent shows. And one of the things I would do is I I never sat at one lunch table in high school. Um, I kind of bounced around. I had like two or three tables that I would go and sit uh, and hang out with during lunch. So I never really had like a particular uh, lunch table that uh, I, I hung out with. And uh, one of the tables was with uh, a good friend of mine, Derek Christek, a, a very, very talented uh, musician. Uh, he plays in the band Recluse. He has a solo project called The Omniverse, which is phenomenal. Uh, highly recommend you guys go check this shit out. But at that time, Derek was in a, uh, a acoustic band called Sleepy V. Sleepy V was what they were called. Uh, this was Gene Brickhamen, Matt Stromberg, and Derek Christek. And they were a trio, and they were going to audition. Uh, I think they might have been debuting uh, at the talent show, like, if they got in, uh, was sort of what they were talking about. Or they had maybe done a couple of, like, coffee house performances or something. Um, but it was a kind of, like, a big deal for, for them, too. Um, so Derek was like, you should audition. And I was like, what am I going to audition with? I don't really have, like, talents. Because at that point, I didn't believe that I did, right? I didn't know that you could do talents as, like, I didn't know that I had a, a, a talent. I, I still wouldn't consider myself, like, a talent uh, or anything. But, like, I didn't think that I did. So I just was just like, what the fuck am I going to do? And he was, Der Derek was like, tell jokes. You got all these stories about your parents and, you, you, you know, you're funny and shit. And, like, you do, you got all these bits. And I was like, ah, get the fuck out of here. I don't got bits. I don't have any bits. And uh, so then I kind of, like, I, I, I kept thinking about it, right? And, and I'm sure that somewhere in the back of my mind, that performance from 12-year-old uh, Krish was, was kind of circulating, you know, in, in, the, in the unconscious portions of my brain. And uh, I went home, and I kept thinking about it all day. Um, and I was like, yeah, fuck it. I'll write, I'll write some jokes, you know? So I, I, I got note cards... Because when you're in high school, that's sort of a thing that you have. You have an you have an abundance of uh, of, of of note cards. Uh, so I got eight note cards and I wrote down eight jokes. Uh, well, a couple of them were, you know, again like the growing up in an Indian family and something about the dot was was uh, part of part of this 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 talent show uh, audition notes that I that I wrote down. Um, and I went in, I signed up for it. I signed up and after school, they held the auditions and I went in and I had my note cards and I didn't want to look at my note cards during the performance. So, um, you know, I tried to like do my best to, to memorize them, uh, which I think applied to how I perform comedy, uh, later, it probably informed the way that I, uh, perform comedy. Like once I got into, uh, my early twenties as well, uh, five or six years after this, but, uh, you know, I memorized them and I got up and, I, and it was literally like two, uh, both the teachers that were, um, that were in charge of, of picking the, the people in the talent show, right? So Alan Welding was one of them and I can't remember the other teacher for the life of me. I do remember that he had a beard. That, that I remember. Uh, it was, a, it was one of the beardy teachers. I remember that. I don't remember which beardy teacher it was, but I remember Alan Welding being one of them because Alan Alan Welding becomes important later in the story as well. Uh, but it was to them and basically to like a couple of the students that, because I, I think I was like towards the end of, of the auditions. So it was like uh, Derek, Gene, and Matt stuck around and maybe one or two of the other kids and then uh, Mr. Welding and beardy, beardy teacher whose name I can't remember I, for whatever reason, and I kind of feel bad about it. But 
Uh, so it was like a super small, so like the first time I ever like performed these jokes, it was kind of like doing it in an open mic, <laughs> you know, where it was like, there's a lot of pressure for virtually no apparent fucking reason. Um, and, uh, and there was not a lot of people there. <laughs> so it was very much like an open mic. <laughs> And I, and you know, they, there were some, I, I remember some chuckles and some giggles, you know, and, uh, and I felt, uh, I was like, all right, cool. I, I, I did that. Uh, I, I got on the after school bus, uh, and I went home and I didn't expect anything to come out of it. I expected absolutely nothing to fucking happen. Uh, I, you know, uh, because there were like a bunch of kids that tried out. A lot of people were doing, uh, the, there were a couple bands that tried out at one point. There was, um, uh, a couple people doing, like, songs from, from, uh, musicals and, uh, you know, thing, things of, things of, uh, of that kind. Uh, uh, there, I, I think there were even some people doing monologues, uh, uh of sorts, you know, so, um, I didn't fucking expect to get in. So then, a couple days later, when the decisions were being made, uh, one Mr. Alan Welding, you guys remember, uh, from that time, uh, well, Alan Kim comes up to me and says, uh, hey, listen, you're in the talent show. You got it? I was like, holy shit, that's crazy. That's, uh, did, I, did, 100% did not expect because I, I, I didn't and uh, and he goes well here's the thing so you're not going to be part of like the competition uh, of the talent show but you're in the talent show and I was like I don't understand uh, anything that you're fucking trying to tell me right now um, and he goes look there's there's like nobody that we can compare you to uh, because there's no nobody doing like stand-up comedy like you're the only person in this thing doing stand-up comedy you're the only person doing any form of comedy period so he was like we don't know we there's no way for us to like compare you to anybody else and I was like oh sure okay so like what so in my mind like for a number of years uh and I know this is not what he meant I 100% fucking know that this is not what he meant but this is how you know like uh, comedian my, my brain and I would say a lot of comedians brains are wired for self-loathing and self-deprecation which is where a lot of our comedy comes from is just the hatred for ourselves as people um, you know that's where the the, the, the the juicy comedy comes from <laughs> is that self-deprecating <laughs> no notion of it and I 100% know that this is not what he meant and I don't even th I don't even believe this statement but for a long time I took what he said and in my uh, you know kind of like warped ahead was just like oh that was Mr. Welding being very kind and polite in saying nobody's stupid enough to do comedy and they're definitely not dumb enough to do stand-up comedy uh, to stand up on stage alone in front of fucking everybody, everybody that you know, uh, and then try to be funny on purpose like you think you can be, uh, nobody is that dumb. So we don't know what the fuck to do with you. Like, that's what my head <laughs> thought he was saying. I know that's not what he meant. I know that's not what he meant. Um... But, you know, that's, I, I, I had a very uh, l low opinion of myself. Not that I have a very high opinion of myself, but I have a, uh, a better understanding of who I am and what my, uh, you know, self-worth is and all that other stuff now because I'm uh, like an uh, adult human that understands but my emotions a little bit better <laughs> than a 16-year-old would, <laughs> hopefully. But, uh, <laughs> you know... Um, so I was like, yeah, okay. And he was like, so what, what we're going to have you do in the talent show is kind of be um, kind of be like a co-host. And I was like, okay. And he's like, because one of the teachers was going to host it, right? They were going to host it. 
uh, and there were a few bands uh, that they had set up kind of back to back and they would need time to get that band off and get a new band up uh, or just set up technical specs for you know a, a little bit more complicated performance so I was gonna be the buffer point so I would go up in between these these bands or these more technically precise performances and do five minutes of comedy and I was going to do that three times. Um, and so he looked at me and he was like, do you have uh, 15 minutes of comedy? And I looked at him and I said, yes. Yes, I do. I can do how much ever time you want me to do. You need me to do uh, an hour? I got that, baby. I've got that. I've done comedy maybe one time. Uh, and I was very hesitant about doing it that one time. But I got hours of material. Uh, you need me to do how much ever, which was a, a total lie. Like I had eight minutes. That's it. I had eight note cards of one minute jokes, and that's it. Like I didn't have. I barely. I was just like, what the fuck am I gonna do for fifteen? How am I gonna come up with seven more minutes of material? Um, you know, before this fucking talent show was gonna happen. So, uh, I didn't know what open mics were. That was not a thing that I was. Uh, I was privy to. Not knowledge that I had known about, but they were going to do a couple of rehearsals. Uh, so I was able to use those as kind of open mics to, um, to kind of basically workshop seven new minutes of material or take that eight minutes and a couple of the, a couple of the jokes be able to write a little bit more um, or kind of transform them a little bit. And, uh, and that's kind of what I did. Right, because I didn't I didn't know what the fuck I was gonna do. I just knew that I had to come up with three five minute segments, uh, and, uh, and you know, and and work out some material. So uh, we had maybe four rehearsals, something like that. So every time I would hit these rehearsals, I would do, you know, I would try to run through some of the newer material that I would have in order to like figure out. Uh, what is and isn't working based on the reaction of the people that I already knew found some of my things funny. And um, I, I kind of struggled a little bit coming up with that last five minutes, uh, to be honest. Uh, and, uh, you know, I kind of didn't know what to do. So I talked about, like, being a disappointment to my parents because I wanted to, like, go into the arts uh, and hope that I could kind of use that to flush out uh, more time. Um, and I, I didn't hit my mark. To, I kind of, I, I like didn't hit that additional five during these rehearsals. I had a little bit, but I was falling a little short, uh, especially during that last one. Um, so, you know, during the first act, I would come out twice. And during the last act, I would come out once. Um, and yeah, I just remember like not having that last five minutes flushed out. I just didn't, I just didn't have it. And I, I kind of got worried about it. And um, I will say one of the more, one of the bits that I am kind of proud of from that era, from this first time really writing jokes, uh, was I had a bit about Benito Mussolini uh, and his invasion of Ethiopia, that was, a, that was the thing that I wrote about, and I kind of flushed that out a little bit, and I had a friend, uh, who was, you know, in the, uh, talent show as well, a band called the, a, a Fine Line, a Fine Line, uh, they were in the talent show, and, uh, Curtis, God, what is his last name, but his name is Curtis, uh, he came up to me and was basically like, uh, you should call him Benny. Uh, cause they're all like, cause they're, you should call Benito Mussolini Benny in the joke. And I was like, oh, that's fucking hilarious. So I started calling Benito Mussolini Benny, uh, and kind of, you know, basically taking a jab at this fucking fascist leader in Italy. As a 16 year old, I already kind of knew that authoritarianism wasn't going to be my jam. Uh, I think I knew that as like a fucking five year old because I was always, I was kind of a dick when I was a, a five year old. But 
so I, I you know, uh, the day of the talent show comes, and uh, here, here's what I wore, and I'm, I'm very surprised that people let me do this. I don't know why. Maybe they thought I was kind of, maybe they thought this was part of the act or something, um, but I don't think they should have let me do this. I think this was a, this was a bad call. Um, here's the outfit that I chose to wear uh, the day of the talent show. And, you know, I think my mother let me wear this in the sense of uh, people will think that what he's wearing is so outrageous and they will make fun of him uh, so much that... Uh, he'll never do stand-up comedy again, and uh, my mother really underestimated um, really just how dumb I am uh, and, and just how filled with hubris a 16-year-old stupid little head is. Uh, <laughs> you know, I wore uh, jean shorts, because that was my jam uh, at the age of 16, is jean shorts. It's also the springtime, it's April. You know, um, and, and then I wore a polo shirt. Uh, I tucked I tucked the polo shirt into the jean shorts, uh, and, and then I uh, oh no I didn't I thought about tucking it in but I didn't like uh, tucking in uh, shirts at the time, and then I and then I wore a tie with a polo shirt, and it, and I'm not done, and then I wore a top hat just to kind of fucking essentially uh, cap it off if I may if I may and people were just kind of okay with me wearing that which is like the craziest outfit that I've ever worn in my entire life and there was another thing that I remember doing as well, is uh, there was a fellow by the name of Andrew Boschancic who lives in D.C. and actually came to see my show uh, last October. It was really nice to see him because I hadn't seen him in quite some time. Um, but Andrew had convinced me that after my last set, I should uh, throw my top hat into the because it'll be cool if I if I frisbeed my top hat. Uh, into into his hands as I'm getting off stage, and I was like, "Haha, you you are correct, sir. This is a genius idea. People will love me for it, uh, and, and they'll think it's so cool because I think it's so cool." And, uh, and I, I think I did do that. Uh, I think I did do that. <laughs> uh, so I walked out of the house in this ridiculous fucking outfit. Got and got on. I did my set, and it went well. It went pretty, pretty darn well, I should say. Uh, and the last set, uh, I talked about the, you know, being a disappointment to my parents. I don't think this set particularly went as uh, awesome as I remember it. Uh, but uh, you know, and then I kind of like didn't know what to do, and I and uh, so I. I had to come up with something, so I ad-libbed uh, five minutes of my dad ranting in an Indian accent. Uh, and that killed, I think. Because people um, really like it, it when, when I did the Indian accent. People kind of fucking loved it. Uh, and, uh, you know, my, my opinion on that has changed over the years. And I'm not a huge fan of doing the Indian accent anymore. I, I don't do it in my act anymore. I haven't done it in a number of years. Uh, partly because I don't think that, that they're laughing at the writing. They're kind of just laughing at the accent. And uh, that's not where I want, to, uh, want people to der derive my humor from. Anyway, so th and then I did the hat thing. I, I kind of threw it. At Andrew, I don't think I threw it at him because I'm I, I don't have um, what people would consider athleticism. I'm not a very athletic person. Uh, <laughs> and then I got off stage, man, and that was like the first time that I ever did it, you know. And uh, I, I and then I didn't. I never thought I would do it again. 
legitimately. Like I was just like, this is sort of a one and done kind of a fucking thing. And uh, my I, like my mom was glad that I did it and was very much hoping that I would not uh, do it again. And uh, I think we were both wrong, clearly. Um, because after that, uh, there was an open mic every single Friday at a place called The Coffee Den. Uh, and it's actually, it was very close to where I'm living now, where, you know, uh, right next to my parents' uh, place. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, the Coffee Den shut down, oh my gosh, years ago. Uh, the building doesn't even exist anymore. They kind of um, got rid of the whole fucking building. They got rid of the whole complex that it was in. Uh, there was like a supermarket that used to be right there. I think it might have been a, a family-owned supermarket. But uh, I had my Derek Christek again invited me to come do that open mic um, and do some of my jokes. And you know, uh, he was like, "That's where." Sleepy B tries out new songs, uh, and so I went and uh, did that open mic, and then I started doing that open mic pretty much every Friday. That was kind of like a thing that I did for a while, um, and I kind of had to teach myself to be like, no, it's okay to do the same jokes over and over again, but part of the other thing was too is people would request jokes from me. Um, like people that I knew from high school would be like, you should do that Benito Mussolini joke. Nobody ever requested Benito Mussolini joke. I just did the Benito Mussolini joke because I like doing the Benito Mussolini joke. Um, but I have seldom did people request the Benito Mussolini joke. Uh, but, um, I kept doing that. And then eventually, uh, Sleepy V would have concerts at the coffee den uh, and, you know, like, a ton of people from high school would show up. So I would show up, and then when they would do an intermission, uh, Derek, Gene, and Matt would ask me to come and do stand-up during the intermission. And so I would gladly oblige and uh, do stand-up because, you know, the beginning of uh, any stand-up comedian's career is that they are a, a giant whore for attention and, will, and just will do it at anywhere, at any place, like a park, I've done stand up uh, at a at a park during the daytime, uh, which you which you one hundred percent should not do. Uh, I've opened for friends like uh, metal concerts, um, which you should also not do, ever, because it's it's a, a just a um, just in bad form. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear jokes uh, about the immigrant lifestyle after they punch their best friend in the face, uh, to show, uh, that they love them. That's, that's just not a thing that people are interested in seeing. Um, but, uh, I did that. I hosted, uh, I did the intermission of a fashion show in high school at 1.2 because they asked me to come do the intermission of a, of a fashion show. And again, I think Chris Tech was the one that convinced me that I should do that one. Uh, and, and I kept doing it. I kept, I just, every time somebody would ask me to do something, I would just fucking go and do it. And then at the end of high school, uh, after graduation, a week after I graduated high school, oh uh, man, uh, this is probably the most delusional and embarrassing part of uh, this entire situation. And, and that is that I fucking went and recorded an album when I was 17 years old. I recorded an album. Uh, a month after I graduated, I, I set up uh, a date at the at the old coffee den. I had Derek Christek come in and uh, bring his recording equipment, which uh, I invited a whole bunch of my friends and a whole bunch of people from high school uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I, and I fucking recorded an album that was, it was like 80, 80 minutes or something. And it's not good. You guys, like it's available for people to listen to, um, as a special exclusive download. If you become a sustaining member on my Bandcamp page, <laughs> It's the only way you'll ever be able to listen to it. There's like 10 people 
that know what I sound like <laughs> as a 17 year old uh, <laughs> the material that I did as a 17 year old I talked about working in Subway I talked about working at Shop and Save uh, you know uh, like it's not good like it's <laughs> it's just fucking and here's the reason why I did this right this is the reason why I did this I did it because um, I figured if I had this recording and I, oh I also I also set up my fucking camera I had a v, like this VHS uh, recorder that I could plug into my TV and then record a VHS of my stand-up comedy. This no fucking lie, you guys. No fucking lie. So th somewhere, uh, probably in my storage, there is a VHS copy of this set uh, that nobody ain't gonna see. Nobody's gonna fucking see that shit. Uh, guaranteed, dog. <laughs> I am not gonna show that to, to, to any... I might release it on my deathbed and be like, who can make fun of me now to my face? Nobody. And nobody can speak ill of the dead. Nobody can speak ill of the dead. Uh, I win. Uh, but um, that is uh, that is unfortunately not uh, not the case. Because I, I, I honestly don't even know where this VHS tape is. But that happened. Um, and then I just... Uh, I, I kind of kept doing it, and then I set up another fucking show at the coffee den, and, and I did, I like, did not do well. I remember, I remember that being, uh, something that I had to kind of cope with, is what, it, this was, like, truly, truly one of the first times that I remember bombing, because I, because, like, I didn't, I didn't really write, uh, a lot of new material, I didn't, I, not even new material. I didn't write good material. Because I was 17 and I thought I could just fucking turn out 45 minutes in three months. Which is like, no. That's not how it works. You should chill the fuck out. Uh, you should take your time with it. You're not on a deadline of any kind. You know? You should learn how to write material. <laughs> uh, and, uh... Oh, man. There's just a $20 bill. I don't know who that is. But, um... You know, uh, that was a weird sidebar. But, you know, I, I... I remember bombing my ass off and then ha and then hanging out with uh, with Sleepy V, who had a big announcement to make uh, about adding... Like, I think they were adding a new member to their band or something along those lines. Um, that was a show that... It, and then I kept performing through college. Uh, and then I didn't really do any, like, real big shows... Actually, when I was in college, I remember uh, writing my first political joke of all time, uh, and it fucking did not go well. Uh, that also did not go well. Um, I wrote a joke during, uh, boy, before Obama was elected, during the Democratic primaries, uh, and uh, and I remember there was a bunch of Democratic candidates. I think this was the year that Barack Obama became the front runner. And I, can't, I, I wrote a joke. I'm, gonna try, I'm, I'm not going to do a good job of telling it the way that I told it. Basically, it was something to the effect of, you know, I'm watching these uh, these these primaries here, Oops. Um, and you know, the Democrats they they just keep arguing with themselves and um, calling each other names, and they keep fighting over and over again. And while these Democrats are fighting, uh, what we what we aren't realizing is that the Republicans are getting one step closer to finding the doomsday machine. And that was my joke. That was like the big political thing that I, I wrote. Uh, and nobody laughed at it. Everybody was very confused about why I was talking about it. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, so was I. Uh, and I was like, okay. I had one of my friends who was a barista at the coffee den. He laughed and gave me a, a sad applause. <laughs> <laughs> That's like one of the saddest things too is is like when nobody laughs but only one person applauds at your joke and you're just like, bah, all right, great. Fuck. Uh, 
me and that guy, I guess. That's it. Ugh, shit. You know. But I just kept doing it all through college. Uh, I would do an, I, I would do um, these open mics at my college. That uh, there was one at uh, a, a, a CCAC branch campus that I would go to on a monthly basis, pretty much. Um, and then I would go to I would go do like an open mic that was at my campus, and I would never tell anybody that I was going to do it. Uh, that was run by this girl who had like a choir club or something, but the choir club ran an open mic or I, I don't fucking, I don't particularly remember it as well. Uh, but I, but I do remember going to it a bunch of times. I would never really tell people that I was doing it. I would just kind of go do it. Um, I kept opening for bands whenever I got the opportunity to, but I also like didn't really know um, you know, what a, what a career in stand-up really looked like. It would be years till I figured that out. Uh, but I did, I kept doing it in college. I had friends of mine that would, uh, request jokes. Um, and then I did a, I, I did a, um, I did, I, what did I do? I did a, I did a comedy contest in, uh, at the improv when I was 18, actually. So my freshman year of college, I think. Or was it my freshman? Yeah, it was the end of my freshman year of college. I did this comedy competition at the improv. I got in and uh, I got, I, I made it to the finals. I became a runner up in the finals. A shit ton of people came to see me in the finals, which was crazy. Uh, and something that I don't think I particularly expected. Um, and and then, like, I, the, the woman that was running the improv at the time was, uh, was trying to groom me, I guess, to become a host, uh, and then she got fired, so that never, that never happened, uh, or she left, I, I don't know, the ins and outs of that are, uh, complicated, and I don't particularly know the exact details of that, uh, but she was no longer with the improv, so my prospects of, you know, becoming uh, a MC at the Pittsburgh Improv was basically dissipated by the time I turned 19. Um, never got work at the Improv. I never, I, I barely got work at comedy clubs because after that, I did those contests a couple times. I met some people in the comedy scene while I was still in college, but I was never able to really go to an open mic because they were all at bars and I didn't turn 21 until my senior year of college. My senior year of college is, is when I turned 21 and started uh, going in and doing open mics in the Pittsburgh comedy scene. And I met pretty much all of like some really close friends of mine, uh, Derek Minto, Zach Funk, Ron Placone, uh, you know, some people that aren't doing comedy anymore, Jane Dan Genesis, uh, some people that have moved away from Pittsburgh, like Ray Zawadney, I met, you know, doing this, like, and that was the first time that I really figured out, like, what, what comedians do, like, what, what it is to be around comedians, and, like, really felt comfortable, um, just being myself, I think, a lot more. And if it wasn't for Ron Placone, I don't think I would have really become a touring performer. Uh, because Ron was the person that kind of encouraged me to do it. Um, and become become a, a, a touring stand-up and, uh, you know, taught me how to reach out and set up emails and what clubs you're looking for. And I tried that path for a while. And I really didn't know what exactly that was going to bring. I didn't have like a, a sense of focus in terms of being a touring comedian. So I tried to do some clubs. I did, I did a few, I worked at Hilarities. I became a host at Hilarities. So I would host, you know, three or four weekends out of the year in Cleveland. But really, uh, in 2015 is... 2015, around that time, is when I figured out what I really wanted to do as a touring performer. Just tour the way that I'm touring now. Oh, well. 
not now now, but you guys get it. You guys understand what I'm what I'm doing when when we're not in a pandemic. Um, it's basically I, I'm I I want to be out on the road and work with uh, smaller kind of DIY venues uh, and build a following. Build you know ha make sure that there's some people coming out to see me on purpose. That's it. Uh, I'm not looking to fill out like stadiums or anything. I'm not looking to fill out. Uh, fucking giant arenas. Um, I like comedy when it's uh, a lot more personal. I like comedy when it's in a, a, a nice intimate space. Uh, 30 to 50 seats is sort of the, the thing that I'm looking for. Uh, and there are certain cities where I have regularly been able to achieve that over the last maybe three years. 30 to 50 seats. Uh, you know, Places like Minneapolis, places like Norfolk, Virginia, uh, Lansing, Michigan, Huntsville, Alabama, um, you know, and uh, and it feels good to do that. And I'm hoping that we can get back to that. Uh, but it's been it's been a, a a wild, weird, fucking 15 year ride of uh, you know. And uh, I have I still I like it was really cool to fucking see Alan Welding at at my. Uh, at, at my last stand-up comedy recording last year. That was really fucking cool. Um, I, I also, it's really also cool to, to see, like, some of my teachers, uh, paying attention to what I'm doing, uh, in some of these videos. That's really cool, too. That kind of, uh, makes me very happy to, to see that that's really cool to see them supporting this still this this shit still uh you know they just it yeah it just feels pretty good and i and i feel like i've i've i'm not famous by any means uh i don't i don't have <clears throat> you know this huge giant following or anything but i do have a couple people that that watch my stuff on a on a fairly regular basis that that come out to see me on a fairly regular basis uh, that support my work on a fairly regular basis. And, uh, and I'm very thankful for that. Uh, and it makes me feel very, uh, uh, yeah, I have a lot of gratitude to, to, to the people that, you know, still support all this shit. So, yeah, that's the, that's the whole tale, you guys. That's, that's kind of the, you know, at the end, it was just a little brief history of, of, uh, of my touring history, I guess. Uh, brief history of my touring history. That's right. Uh, what an idiot sometimes I am. <laughs> so, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the story. That is your, that is your storytelling Saturday, uh, tale of excitement, intrigue, mystery, perhaps. <laughs> Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you guys for tuning in. Um, every Saturday, we'll tell. I'll, I'll, I'll be trying to bring a new story to the table. Um, I have. I actually do have some stuff coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, like I said, April twenty fifth, next Saturday, eight thirty. I'm going to be doing a very short uh, Zoom test show. What is that going to entail? It's going to entail uh, me telling some some jokes, working on this format. Uh, you know, it'll be 40 minutes maximum, um, and then kind of trying to figure out what the kinks of it are. I'm going to try to make it a little bit more dynamic and interactive, so I'm working to figure out if that's possible. If that's not possible, that's okay. I'll work with what I got. I'll work with what I got. Uh, if this format works, I will try to do it on a semi-regular basis, because that's kind of how I've got it built out at the moment. Um, the way I came up with the format is basically to build it out so that people can come back on a semi-regular basis to come check out the show, and there will always be something a little bit new uh, with this show. So uh, there will be some sameness, there will be some newness. Uh, I'm going to limit the first real, real show to about 20 people so that it doesn't get too overwhelming or too overcrowded and uh, too crazy and then kind of build up from there. 
uh, other than that, um, you know, same old stuff. Make sure you guys share uh, share this stuff out. Uh, that's a huge, huge help when you when you guys do. Uh, make sure you hit the likes and are subscribed because uh, I'm putting up videos virtually every single day. I'm working on a bunch of content. Um, uh, and uh, leave comments because I respond to those. Um, what else? Oh, if you can donate, you can make a donation. Uh, you can go to the, the web, my website, ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. Um, to to make your make that donation happen, um, there's sustaining membership options, one-time donations options. But uh, by no means do you have to donate. That's not a necessity to enjoy my content. Uh, it's just an extra token of appreciation, as I see it. And there's a lot of people that have donated already, and uh, uh, I, I love you guys for it. <laughs> you guys are fucking awesome. To become sustaining members to make uh, you know even these one-time donations they're they're great they're very very helpful uh, in this time of the, the great quarantine that we are in um, also my albums are available I do have news about that yes okay uh, and this will kind of I guess be a nice little little way to uh, cap off this thing so um, all of my albums right now on Bandcamp are available as pay what you want, which is basically means that they're available for free. Uh, pay what you want, they're available for free. And, um, uh, you know, go and enjoy them if you would like to. I have a bunch of them. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be releasing my sixth comedy album on June 1st. I will be making an event for that once all of the uh, links are ready to go with it. Um, again, the Bandcamp is probably going to be the best way to get it. Because what I'm going to do with the Bandcamp is I'm going to set it as a pay-what-you-want model. Uh, so people, if, if, you, if you, you know, are also in a financial bind but you want to listen to uh, my comedy or comedy in general, you have an uh, option to do that, to download it and just enjoy it. Um, so uh, that's going to be coming out June 1st. And the Bandcamp is also going to have a special bonus version of the album where it's going to be virtually the same material, but it's going to be, uh, you know, basically encapsulating the special moments that happened on tour that are probably never going to happen again. Uh, and they're not like the cleanest, uh, tightest performances. They're, they're me taking these wild little deviations based on the material itself. So, uh, they're fun little different versions of, of the material that I wanted to share with you guys. So there's going to be, two, like I said, two, uh, different versions of the album and they'll be available, uh, on Bandcamp, um, coming out June 1st. So stay tuned for that. Keep your eyes open uh, and peeled for that. But all of my other albums are available on the band camps as, as free, pay what you want, uh, kind of a model. So you can go enjoy them, uh, uh, enjoy them there. And uh, if you become a sustaining member, maybe you know if you do choose to become a sustaining member, if you if you have if you can, uh, it, you'll get to listen to that uh, that very very first album that I dropped back in two thousand six. You guys. Uh, and it's uh, it's real bad. It's not great. So you can you can enjoy that really t uh, terrible piece of comedy that I thought uh, was gonna be uh, my ticket to fame. That's that's basically what I thought it was. My old ticket to fame. You can enjoy old delusional Krish. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so those are those are there, and I'll be making an event for the uh, album release, like the digital album release soon. Maybe I'll try to do a digital album release show uh, because it does look like, um, with the way things are kind of proceeding, I will be losing a majority of June. I'm I'm out all of May. All of May is gonna it has been uh, canceled and and will be rescheduled. And it looks like a majority of June will probably end up 
uh, being in that same boat. So that's why the, these online Zoom shows are going to wind up being pretty important and maybe I'll do an online Zoom show uh, album release kind of a thing and make it kind of like a big, bigger event and do a little bit more of a traditional style show. Uh, but anyway, uh, stay tuned for all that. Be good to each other and we'll see you soon. Bye.